This is the Edexcel Higher Tier Paper 1 from summer 2022. It's paper one, it's a non-calculator paper. Question one is a solve. Solve 7x minus 27 is less than eight. So we want to get x by itself. So we're gonna add 27 to both sides. So if we add 27 to both sides, we get 7x is less than 35. And then to get x by itself, we divide both sides by seven. The moment x is multiplied by seven, the opposite of timesing is dividing. So divide both sides by seven. 35 over seven is five. So x is less than five. Question two, write 124 as a product of its prime factors. So we're gonna change 124 into a product so times together, numbers times together, and it's, it's prime factors times together. So I'm gonna break 124 down. It's in the two times table, and half of 124 is 62. So 124 is two times 62. We could write it as two times 62, but we could break 62 down again. Again, 62 is in the two times table, Half of 62 is 31, and 31 is a prime number. So we can write 124 as two times two times 31, or we could write two squared times 31. Either one of these are correct. So I'll write two squared times 31. Question three. A delivery company has a total of 160 cars and vans. The number of cars to the number of vans is the ratio three to seven. Each car and each van uses electricity or diesel or petrol. One eighth of the cars use electricity. 25% of the cars use diesel. The rest of the cars are petrol. Work out how many cars use petrol. So we're going to use the ratio to find how many cars there are. And then we can use these fractions and percentages to work out how many petrol cars we have. So there are 10 parts here, three to seven means there are 10 parts in total. And each part must be equal. So we're going to share the 160 equally between these 10 parts, 160 divided by 10 is 16. So each part is worth 16. So we've got three 16s and seven 16s. Three 16s, three 10s are 30, three sixes are 18. So three 16s is 30 plus 18, 48. So there are 48 cars we don't actually need to know how many vans there are, so we could work it out. It would be, well, 60 take away 48, 112, but we don't need to know. We only need to know about cars. One eighth of the cars use electricity. So one eighth of 48 is the number of electric cars. And to find an eighth of the number, we can divide it by eight. So 48 divided by eight is six. If you're not sure, you can simplify this fraction. Half the top, half the bottom, half the top, half the bottom, and we get six. So we have six electric cars. Twenty-five percent of the cars are diesel. So twenty-five percent of 48, a diesel, 25% is the same as a quarter. So a quarter of 48, which is 48 divided by four, which is 12, a diesel cars. And the rest are petrol. So if we take the number of cars, which is 48, take away the electric cars, 
and take away the diesel cars. So take away the electric gets us to 42. Take away the diesel gets us to 30. So there are 30 petrol cars. And that's what we wanted to know. So that is our answer. Question four. Write 1.63 times 10 to the power of negative 3 as an ordinary number. So when we have a negative power, 10 to the power of negative 3, that's the same as dividing by 10 three times. So it's 1.63 divided by 10 three times. So that would be 0 0.00163. Part B, write 438,000 in standard form. So standard form is a number between 1 and 10. So that's going to have to be 4.38. And then times 10 to a power. So how many times do we have to times 4.38 by 10 to get our number? So 1, 2, 3, 4 five times and part c work out four times ten to the power of three times six times ten to the power of negative five give your answer in standard form for this one we can times our two numbers on the front together times the four and the six that's 24 and then times our indices so 10 cubed times 10 to the power of negative 5. When we multiply indices, we add the powers. So 3 plus minus 5, that's the same as 3 minus 5, and that's negative 2. So we've got 24 times 10 to the power of negative 2, but that's not in standard form. Standard form has to be a number between 1 and 10. 24 isn't between 1 and 10. So we can change 24 into 2.4 times 10. And then that is times 10 to the power of negative 2. So we've got 10 to the power of 1 times 10 to the power of negative 2. When we multiply indices, we add the powers. 1 plus negative 2 is the same as 1 take away 2, which is negative 1. So our answer is 2.4 times 10 to the power of negative 1. Question 5. Here is a regular hexagon and a regular pentagon. And between them, we've got the angle X marked. We need to work out the size of the angle marked X. And we need to show where we're working. So we can work out the angles in regular polygons. And one way of doing it is by starting with the exterior angles. So all exterior angles and the exterior angles are the ones on a straight line with the interior angles. So this is an exterior angle of the hexagon. And every exterior angle around the shape has to add up to 360 degrees. So a hexagon has got six exterior angles. So we can work out the size of each one by doing 360 divided by 6. 36 over 6 is 6, so 360 over 6 is 60. So this angle is 60 degrees. And then if we wanted, we could work out the interior angle. 180 take away 60 is 120 degrees. We can do the same with the pentagon. So a pentagon is going to have five exterior angles. They have to add up to 360. So 360 divided by five. 360 divided by 10 is 36. Double that is 72. So each exterior angle is 72. And again, we can work out the interior angles by doing 180 take away that. 180 take away 72 is 108 degrees. So now we know every 
interior angle of these shapes and every exterior angle. So this one here is 120. This angle here is 108. So we could use angles around the point, add up to 360. Alternatively, we could cut it, cut the angle X in half and say we have a 60 degrees and a 72 degrees. And we'll just add the 60 and 72 together. It's a slightly easier calculation. So 60 and 72 will make 132 degrees. So that is the angle X, 132 degrees. Question six, complete the table of values for Y equals X squared minus three X plus one. So this is gonna be a quadratic graph, a positive quadratic graph. So we're gonna be expecting this sort of shape. So we should be getting a symmetrical pattern with these numbers here. So if we're gonna be looking out for a symmetrical pattern, if we don't get it, we should be checking our work. So I'm gonna start with the positive numbers because they're easier to work out. So when X is four, Y will be equal to four squared minus three fours plus one. Four squared is 16, three fours are 12. So 16 take away 12 is four, then plus one is five. The same again with three. Three squared is nine. Take away three threes, which is nine again. Nine take away nine is nothing. Plus one is one. And we can see we've got one and one here. So we'll probably be getting, or we should get, a negative one here to make it symmetrical and a five here. But we can check that. So for two, y equals two squared minus three twos plus one. Two squared is four, three twos are six. So four take away six is negative two, plus one is negative one. And with negative one, negative one squared is positive one. Take away three negative ones and take away a negative, a negative times a negative is positive. So it's one plus three plus one, which is five. Part B says on the grid, draw the graph. And it's for these values up here, the same graph. Y equals X squared minus three X plus one. From negative one to four for X, and they are the ones we've worked out. So we've got negative one, five, zero, one, one, negative one, two, negative one, 3, 1, and 4, 5. And we want to join them up with a smooth curve. So not straight lines. It needs to be a curved graph. So there is our graph. Using your graph, find estimates for the solutions of the equation x squared minus 3x plus 1 equals 0. So this is the same graph we're using. We've got the graph of y equals x squared minus 3x plus 1. So we're trying to find the roots of this equation where the graph crosses the x-axis. It's where y is equal to 0. So y has been changed to zero here. So where y equals zero is on the x axis. So what are the x values? Now there will be a range of acceptable answers. And from my graph, it looks like I've got 0 0.3 and 2.6. Yours might be slightly off. You might get 0 0.4. You might get 2.5, but um, they'll be in that region. So I've got 0 0.3 and 2.6.
Question seven. Here are two cubes, A and B. So A has got a length of three centimeters, B four centimeters. Cube A has a mass of 81 grams. Cube B has a mass of 128 grams. We need to work out the density of A, the ratio, density of A to density of B. And give your answer in the form A to B, where A and B are integers. So density is equal to mass divided by volume. We've been given the mass. We haven't been given the volume, but we can work it out. So these are cubes. So it's three by three by three and four by four by four. So the volume of A, the volume is equal to three cubes, three times three times three. 3 cubed is 27. And for B, the volume is 4 times 4 times 4. 4 cubed is 64. So now we can work out the density. It's the mass, which we've been given, divided by the volume that we just worked out. So the density is for A, 81 divided by 27 mass divided by volume and 81 over 27 is 3 so the density of a is 3 grams per centimeter cubed and for b the density is the mass which is 128 over the volume which is 64 128 over 64 is 2 so 2 grams per centimetre cubed. So we want density of A to density of B as a ratio 3 to 2. Question 8. The table shows the amount of snow in centimetres that fell each day for 30 days. So we've got a table given the data and the question says work out an estimate for the mean amount of snow per day. So we're going to estimate the mean. And the reason it's an estimate is we don't know the exact amount of snow per day. We only have this range of values. So we're going to estimate that all of these eight days that had 0 to 10 had the midpoint, which is 5 centimetres. We're going to estimate that these 10 days had 15, so the midpoint of 10 and 20. These seven days had 25 centimetres. These two days had 35, and these three days had 45. So we've got the midpoint of each of these, and we're going to do midpoint times frequency. So midpoint times frequency. So eight days with five centimetres of snow, eight fives are 40. So that's 40 in total. 10 15s make 150. Seven, seven 25s is 175, 235 is 70, and 345 will be 135. So that's the total, well they're all the totals, to get the total amount of snow over the 30 days, we need to add all of these up. So in the ones we've got 5 plus 5, which is 10. In the tens we've got 3 and 7, which makes 10, plus another 7, 17, plus another 10, a 4 or 5 and a 1, which is 27. And then in the hundreds, 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 2 is 5. So 570 centimetres of snow in total over the 30 days. And the mean, for the mean, we're going to divide by 30. So 570 over 30, that's the same as 57 over 3, which is 19. So 19 centimetres. Question 9. A cube is placed on top of a cuboid, as shown in the diagram, to form a solid. So the cube has edges of length four centimeters 
So it's four by four by four. The cuboid is seven by six by five. We can see this on the diagram. And we need to work out the total surface area. So it's the area of all the surfaces added together. And for this top surface, where the cube is on the cuboid, it's going to be the cuboid's top, take away the cube's bottom to get the bit that's left over. So we're going to have each cube face. So each cube face is four by four, which is 16 centimeters squared. And we're going to have the front of the cuboid. So let's do the cuboid. So the front is seven by five, which is 35 centimeters squared. The back is the same as the front, so 35 centimeters squared. The side is six by five, which is 30. And there's another side, which is the same. So another 30. We have the bottom, which is six by seven, which is 42 centimeters squared. And then we have this top bit. So it's a 42, a seven by six. So this, this one here is 42, take away a cube face, which is 16. 42 take away 16, so 42 take away 12 is 30, take away another 4 gets us to 26. So we've got a 26 for the top, and then we've got 5 cube faces, so the top and then these 4 sides, so 16 times 5. which is 80. So that's all of, our, um, all of our surfaces. We just need to add them together now. So I think what I'll do, is I'll group some together. So two 35s make 70. Two 30s make 60. A 42 and a 26 are going to make 68. And then... I do the 70, 60, and 80. So 70 plus 60 plus 80, oh, then plus 68. So 70, 60, and 80, that's 210 plus 68, 278 centimeters squared. Question 10. The table shows some information about the profit made each day at a cricket club on 100 days. So we've got a table given information. Again, we've got grouped data. This time we need to complete a cumulative frequency table. So cumulative means add up as we go along. Each one goes on top of the other one. And we can see that in these groups. We've got a 0 to 50 group, which is the same as our top table. So that's 10. There are 10 between 0 and 50. The next group is 0 to 100. So that's the first group and adding on the second group. 10 plus 15 is 25. And then we've got a 0 to 150 group. So that's the first two groups. Add on the next one. So add on 25, which gets us to 50. Then we add on the next one again, so add on 30, which would be 80, add on 5, 85, add on 15, 100. So there's 100 in total, that's everything, the 0 to 300 group, and there were 100 days. So that's a good sign that we've got it right.
And then we need to draw a cumulative frequency graph for this information. So for a cumulative frequency graph, we plot this top point against the cumulative frequency. So 50, 10. So 50, 10. We've got 125, 150, 50. 125, 150, 50. 280, 250, 85. 200 is 80, 250 is 85, and 300 was 100. Now we're going to join these up. We can either use a curve or straight lines. I'm going to use straight lines just because it's easier to do, especially on the computer. But it doesn't matter which you choose, either one is correct. Use your graph to find an estimate for the number of days on which the profit was less than £125. So we're going to go to £125, which is here, go up to our line, and then across. And then we just read off the graph. So it looks like 30, and then each of these will be twos. So around 38. 38 days, less than 125 pounds. Use your graph to find an estimate for the interquartile range. So for the interquartile range, we're cutting the data into well quarters. So there's 100 days in total. The median will be at 50. The lower quartile is a quarter of 100, which would be 25. So we go 25 across to the graph and down. That's 100. Three quarters is at 75. So across to the graph and down. And we read off that number there as well. So we've got the lower quartile is 100 pounds. The upper quartile, say so what's that, 150, 160, 170, 180, 190, well, between 190 and 195, call it 192, 193, either one. So that again, there'll be a range of answers for this one. I'll call it 192. So the interquartile range is the gap between these, between the lower quartile and upper quartile. So upper quartile, take away lower quartile, is the interquartile range. Question 11. Cormac has some sweets in a bag. The sweets are lime flavoured or strawberry flavoured or orange flavoured. In the bag, the number of lime flavoured sweets to the number of strawberry flavoured sweets to the number of orange flavoured sweets is the ratio 9 to 4 to X. Cormac is going to take a sweet at random from the bag. Uh, the probability he takes a lime flavoured sweet is 3 sevenths. Work out the value of X. So 3 sevenths of the sweets are lime flavoured. So three sevenths of the total T is nine parts. So three sevenths of T is nine parts. So T is the total number of parts. So three sevenths of the total number of parts is nine. So that means three sevenths of means times, three sevenths t equals nine, and we can just solve this for t. So times both sides by seven and divide both sides by three. 
Let's divide by three first, just to make the calculations easier. And then times by seven, seven threes are 21. So there must be 21 parts in total. Nine and four make 13. 21 take away 13 is eight. So for lime to be three sevenths, there must be, X must be eight. So X is eight. Question 12, express 0 0.117 with the 17 recurring as a fraction, you must show all your working. So 0 0.117 recurring means we've got 0 0.1 and then the 17 repeats forever. To change this to a fraction, we need to eliminate the recurring bit. So we're going to call 0 .0 0 0.117 recurring. We'll call that x. And we're going to want two things that end in 17 recurring. 17, 17, 17, 17. So if we times by 10, we get 1.17 recurring. So that's one thing that ends in 17, 17, 17, 17. Then if we times by 100 or times the original one by 1000 and get 117.17 recurring, which would be 1000 x's, 1000 times the original, 1, 2, 3, we get something else that ends in 17, 17, 17, 17. And now we can get rid of them. So we can take them away. So if I, if I have a thousand X's and I take away 10 X's, so I'm doing the bottom one, take away the top one. A thousand take away 10 is 990. So 990 of our original, of our X, is equal to 117.17, take away 1.17, which is just 116. So all the 171717s cancelled out, they're gone. So we've got 116 equals 990x. And then we can just get x by itself by dividing both sides by 990. So x is 116 over 990. The question has not asked us to give our answer in, our, in its simplest form. So we're going to leave it like this. 116 over 990. Question 13. A right angle triangle is formed by the diameters of three semicircular regions, A, B, and C, as shown in the diagram. Show that the area of A equals the area of B plus the area of C. This looks very much like Pythagoras and that's how we're going to show it. So we know that this, if we call, usually we have a squared plus b squared equals c squared, but in this case, seeing this one's called c, we can label this one c, this one b, this length b, this length is c, and this length is a. So this time, with these letters, c squared plus b squared equals a squared. So how can we show that this works? Well, we need to work out the area of each of these regions. So the area of a semicircle, of semicircle, is half of pi r squared. It's half the area of a whole circle. And so the radius is going to be well, half of C, half of B, and half of A. So area of region A is half pi times the radius squared, 
and the radius is half a. Area of b, again half pi times r squared, and the radius this time is half of b. And the area of c, half pi r squared, and the radius is half of c. So now we can just simplify this. Let's work out the squared first. So half a squared, half, half squared is half times a half, which is a quarter. And a squared is just a squared. Half b squared, half b times half b, a half times a half is a quarter, b times b is b squared. Half c times half c, half times a half is a quarter, c times c is c squared. And I just simplify this, half times a quarter times the top times the bottom is an eighth. So one eighth of pi a squared equals one eighth of pi b squared plus one eighth of pi c squared. Now all we've got to do is divide through by pi and times through by eight and we will get, so if we times everything by eight, we'll get rid of the eighths and we're left with a squared equals b squared plus c squared. And that was Pythagoras. Therefore, the area of a equals the area of b plus the area of C. Area of A equals area of B plus the area of C. Question 14. Here is a speed time graph and we need to work out an estimate of the gradient of the graph at t equals 2. So we're estimating the gradient at this point. So how steep is the, the curve at that point? So we can't work out the gradient at a point on the curve, but what we can do is work out the gradient of a tangent. So we can draw a straight line that just touches the graph at that point. So a straight line that just touches the graph at that point and work out the gradient of the tangent. So let's find two points on the on this line. We have two two point eight and four four point eight. They can be our two points on the line. And we can work out the gradient of them by doing the change in y divided by the change in x. So y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, change in y over the change in x. So this can be x1, y1, x2, y2. So our gradient is 4.8, take away 2.8, divided by 4, take away 2. And 4.8, take away 2.8 is 2. 4 take away 2 is 2 as well, and 2 over 2 is 1. So we've got a gradient of 1. For every 1 it goes across, it goes up by 1. Across 1, up 1. Across 1, up 1. Again, you might get something slightly different, and that's okay if you get 0 0.95 or 1.05, something in the... Um, in the region around one from your line will be okay for all the marks. What does the area under the graph represent for part B? 
for a speed time graph, the area under the graph is the distance traveled. So the gradient is the acceleration, the area underneath is the distance. So we can just write distance for the mark. Question 15. A, B and C are three points such that A to B is 3A plus 4B. A to C is 15A plus 20B. Prove that A, B and C are on a straight line. So they're on a straight line if they go through the same point and they go in the same direction. So we just, they both got A in them. So they both go through A. We also need to prove they're in the same direction. So that would be one is a multiple of the other one. So A to C is 15A plus 20B. But if we factorize, if we take five out of both of them, we can say it's five times 3A plus 4B. And that is what A to B is. So it can be five times A to B. So it's the same direction. It just goes five times as far. So same direction. Therefore, ABC is a straight line. D, E and F are three points on a straight line such that D to E is 3E plus 6F. E to F is minus 10.5E minus 21F. We want the ratio of D to F, the length of D to F, to the length of D to E. So we haven't been given D to F, we need to work that out. So D to F is the same as D to E plus E to F. So we can get from D to F by going from D to E and then from E to F. So D to E is 3E plus 6F. E to F is minus 10.5E minus 21F. And we can simplify that by adding the E's together and adding the F's together. So for the E's, we've got 3 minus 10.5, which is minus 7.5. For the Fs, we've got 6 take away 21, which is minus 15. And we can factorise to make it look a lot simpler. We can take minus 7.5 outside. So minus 7.5 times E is minus 7.5 E. And minus 7.5 times 2F is minus 15F. So that's D to F, D to E is 3E plus 6F. We can factorize, take three outside. So three times E plus 2F. So we want the ratio of the length of DF to the length of DE. So when we have a length, we can't have a negative length. So we can say that D to F is 7.5 times this, and D to E is three times this. They're going in the opposite direction, but we only care about the length of the line. So we can say D to F, the length of D to F is 7.5 times E plus 2F, the length of DE. So for the lengths, we're ignoring the direction. We don't care about the sign. 3 times E plus 2F. So the ratio of DF to DE is 
two, three. It doesn't say we have to give it in a certain form, but we can simplify this. So we could double both sides and have 15 to six. And then we could divide by three and have five to two. So given them as whole numbers, we can have five to two. And that's our ratio. Question 16. A first aid test has two parts, a theory test and a practical test. The probability of passing the theory test is 0 0.75. The probability of passing only one of the two parts, so that's either theory or practical, pass theory, fail practical, or fail theory, pass practical, is 0 0.36. The two events are independent. So passing one doesn't affect your probability of passing the other. Work out the probability of passing the practical test. So we could represent this with a tree diagram. So we can have the uh, theory and practical. And then we'll have pass and fail pass, fail, pass, fail. So the probability of passing theory is 0 0.75. So the probability of failing the theory must be 0 0.25. Now we don't know the probability of passing the practical. So we've not been given that information. I'm gonna call it X, probability of passing the practical and failing will be 1 minus x. So passing is x, failing is 1 minus x. It's the same probability if you pass or fail the theory. That's what the independent bit means. And we know the probability of passing only one of the two parts is 0 0.36. So pass fail and fail pass these two, this one and this one, these two probabilities added together equals 0 0.36. So we can form an equation for that. So 0 0.75 times 1 minus x plus 0 0.25x equals 0 0.36. So expanding the bracket, 0 0.75 times 1 is 0 0.75. 0 0.75 times negative x is negative 0 0.75x. We have negative 0 0.75 plus 0 0.25, which is negative 0 0.5. So I'm going to add 0.5x to both sides just because I want it to be positive. Take 0.36 away from both sides. So 75 take away 36 is 39. So we've got 0.39 is half of x. So I need to double both sides. 39 doubled is 78 so x is 0 0.78 question 17 why is directly proportional to the square root of t directly proportional is the relationship k times so y is something which i'm going to call k times the square root of t and k is a number that we can work out um we can actually work it out now so 15 is when y is 15 t is 9. so 15 equals k times square root 9. square root 9 is 3 
divide both sides by 3, k is 5. So y is 5 times the square root of t. That's one equation. t is inversely proportional to the cube of x. So inversely proportional is the relationship k divide. So t equals k divided by the cube of x, x cubed. This k and this k are different numbers. We can call them k1 and k2, or use a different letter entirely if you don't want to get them mixed up. But we can work out what it is straight away. When t is 8, x is 2. 2 cubed is 8, so 8 is k over 8 times both sides by 8, so k is 64. So t is 64 over x cubed. And that's our second equation. Find a formula for y in terms of x. So eliminate t. So y in terms of x means get rid of t. So we're going to substitute this equation into our first equation. So we're going to have y equals 5 times the square root of 64 over x cubed. We could simplify it. It does say give your answer in its simplest form. So we're going to have to. So we've got 5 times, we've got square root of all of this. And we can change it to square root the top and square root the bottom. Square root 64 over square root x cubed. Square root 64 is 8, so it's 5 times 8 over the square root of x cubed. And we can do 5 times 8, which is 40. So we've got 40 over the square root of x cubed. y equals 40 over square root x cubed. We can't simplify any more than that, so we'll leave it as it is. Question 18. Work out the value of 5 and 4 ninths to the power of minus a half times 4 and 2 thirds over 2 to the power of negative 3. So this looks quite complicated, but if we change these um, mixed numbers into top heavy fractions, it's going to look a lot simpler. So 5 whole ones and 4 ninths, 5 nines are 45, plus 4 is 49. So 5 and 4 ninths is the same as 49 ninths. That's to the power of minus a half. And these are both square numbers, which makes it a lot simpler. 4 and 2 thirds, 4 threes are 12, plus 2 is 14. So that's 14 thirds. And it's divided by 2 to the power of negative 3. Let's just deal with this 49 over 9 to the power of minus a half. The power of a half means square root, and a minus means flip. So we're going to square root them and flip them over. So if we flip them, it's going to be 9 over 49. And then square root, square root 9 is 3, square root 49 is 7. So we've got 3 sevenths times 14 thirds over 2 to the power of negative 3. We can times these fractions and we could simplify them first. So divide top and bottom by 3, divide top and bottom by 7, and we just get 2. So it's 2 divided by 2 to the power of negative 3. When we divide indices, we take away the powers. So we've got 1 take away negative 3. When we take away a negative, we add. So 2 to the power of 1 divided by 2 to the power of negative 3 is 2 to the power of 4. 
1 minus minus 3 is 4. So we've got 2 to the power of 4, and 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, that's 16. So our answer is 16. Question 19. Solve 1 over 2x minus 1 plus 3 over x minus 1 equals 1. Give your answer in the form p plus or minus root q plus 2, where p and q are integers. So we're just solving this equation. We can start by adding the fractions together. So to add fractions together, we want a common denominator. So we'll times the fraction on the left, the top and bottom, by x minus 1. So 1 times x minus 1 is x minus 1. And 2x minus 1 times x minus 1, we just write as 2x minus 1 times x minus 1. We just write them in brackets. We times top and bottom of the other fraction by this denominator, 2x minus 1. So 3 times 2x minus 1. And then our denominator is the same. 2x minus 1 times x minus 1. And that equals 1 still. Now we can add the fractions. They've got the same denominator. We can add them together. So the denominator is 2x minus 1 times x minus 1. And on top, we've got x minus 1 plus 3 times 2x minus 1. And that equals 1 still. I'm going to get rid of the denominator. So I'm going to times both sides by this denominator. And it will times it up to this side. So timesing both sides by the denominator. And then I'll expand the brackets. I'll expand the brackets this step as well. So 3 times 2x is 6x. 3 times negative 1 is negative 3. So on the left side, I've got x and 6x, which is 7x, and negative 1 take away 3, which is negative 4. On the right, I need to expand these brackets. 2x times x is 2x squared. 2x times negative 1 is negative 2x. Negative 1 times x is minus x. And negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1. I can collect like terms again. So I've got negative 2x take away x, negative 3x. I've got a quadratic. My highest power is an x squared. To solve a quadratic, I want to make it equal to 0. So I'm going to take 7x away from both sides and add 4 to both sides to make it 0. So minus 3x minus 7x is minus 10x. 1 plus 4 is 5. So now I have a quadratic, which I need to solve. I'm giving my answer in a third form. So I'm going to use the quadratic formula. So we can say a is 2. B is negative 10, C is 5, and the quadratic formula is X equals minus B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. So we have minus minus 10 plus or minus the square root of minus 10 squared minus 4 times 2 times 5 all over 2a, which is 2 twos. So simplifying this, minus minus makes a plus. So that's 10 plus or minus the square root. Minus 10 squared is 100. Take away 4 times 2 times 5. 2 fives are 10 times 4 is 40. 
and that's over two twos, which is four. So we have 10 plus or minus the square root of 60 over four. But our answer has to be over two. We can't have over four. So we're going to simplify this third. So to simplify a third, we need to find a square number inside it. So square root 60 is 60 is in the four times table. So it's square root four times square root 15. Square root four is two. So it's two root 15. So we can change root 60 into two root 15s. And then we can just half the top and the bottom. So divide everything by two. So we've got five plus or minus square root 15 over two. Question 20. The center of a circle is the point with coordinates negative one, three. So we've got a circle, the center, is negative one three point a with coordinates six eight lies on the circle find the equation for tangent at a so a tangent is a line that just touches the circle i'll move that line so it just touches the circle doesn't go through it and we want the equation of the tangent at a. Give your answer in the form ax plus by plus c equals zero, where a, b, and c are integers. So to find this tangent, we can use the fact that a radius and a tangent meet at a right angle. So they're perpendicular lines. We can find the gradient of the radius and then because they're perpendicular, we can do the negative reciprocal, flip a minus of that gradient to find the gradient of the tangent. So gradient is the change in y divided by the change in x. And we can have x1, y1, x2, y2. So the gradient of the radius is 8 take away 3 over 6 take away negative 1, which is 5 sevenths. So that's the gradient of the radius. For the tangent, they're perpendicular lines. The gradient is a negative reciprocal. So flip it over and minus. So the gradient of the tangent is flipped over, so 7 fifths and negative, minus 7 fifths. So for a gradient of minus 7 fifths, it's a straight line. The equation of a straight line is y equals mx plus c. So the gradient is minus 7 fifths. So it's y equals minus 7 fifths x plus c. But we don't know the y-intercept yet. We can find it using these points. We know one point, these coordinates, we know one point on the line, and that's at 6, 8. So that's x, y. So let's work out C by changing Y into 8, substituting them in. 8 equals minus 7 fifths times 6 plus C. Minus 7 fifths times 6. So minus 7 times 6 is minus 42. So minus 7 fifths times 6 is minus 42 fifths. Then 
the easiest way to do this is probably to times through by 5, get rid of the fraction. So we need to times everything by 5. 8 fives are 40. Timesing by 5 gets rid of the fifths, and we get 5c. So when we times by 5, we have to times every term by 5. Then plus 42 to both sides. Divide by 5. And we get C. So we have the equation Y equals minus 7 fifths X plus 82 fifths. That's the equation in the form Y equals MX plus C. We don't want it in that form. We want it in the form AX plus BY plus C equals zero, where A, B, and C are integers, whole numbers. So let's times through by five, times every term by five. So five Y equals minus seven X plus 82. And then make it equal to zero. So let's bring everything over to the left side. So I have seven X plus 5y minus 82 equals 0. Question 21. The diagram shows three circles, each of radius 4 centimetres. The centres of A, B and C is a straight line, and A to B and B to C is 4 centimetres. So they're all radiuses. Work out the total area of these two shaded regions and give your answer in terms of pi. So A, B and C are centres of the circle and every radius is four centimetres. So this length is four centimetres. From B to the edge of B is four centimetres. From A to the circumference of A is four centimetres. 4 centimetres, 4 centimetres, 4 centimetres, and so on. So these are all 4 centimetres. Which means that what we have here are equilateral triangles. So 4 centimetres by 4 centimetres by 4 centimetres makes an equilateral triangle. So we also know that all of these angles are 60 degrees. So each angle is 60 degrees, and even this one in here is 60. Angles in a straight line, and these are both 4 centimetres, which means we have another equilateral triangle here, and we could actually keep going around and make a regular hexagon shape by joining them all up. So we need to know the area of these shaded parts. To do that, we're going to have to work out the area of the triangles, the area of the um, segments. The segments are these bits here. So to work out the area of a segment, it's the area of a sector. Take away the area of a triangle. So let's do area of a triangle first. So the area of each of these triangles. We can use half AB sine C, which is probably going to be the easiest way. So the area of a triangle is half AB sine C. So A and B are both four centimeters. C is 60 degrees, so it's half times 4 times 4, sine 60. It's a non-calculator paper, so we can't use our calculator. Sine 60 is square root 3 over 2. So we've got 4, 4 to 16, half of that is 8. So 8 times square root 3 over 2, which is 4 root 3. So the area of each triangle is 4 root 3 centimetres squared. 
we can work out the area of a sector and a sector is the part of a circle so all of this so that whole section there part of a circle so it's 60 degrees or one sixth of the whole circle so it's one sixth area of the sector is one sixth of pi r squared the radius is four so it's one sixth of pi times four squared four squared is 16 16 over six pi or half top and bottom eight thirds pi so that's the area of a sector and the segment is a sector take away a triangle not much room left so area of a segment is a sector which is eight thirds pi take away a triangle which is four root three so now we've got everything we need there's loads of ways now of working out the two shaded areas if we look at this sector here we could have a sector take away two segments so for both of them we've got two sectors take away four segments take away the white bits so two sectors two sectors minus four segments so two sectors so shaded area is two of these two of these eight thirds pies take away four of these four of eight thirds pi minus four root three so two times eight thirds pi is sixteen thirds pi minus four times eight thirds pi which is minus 32 thirds pi and negative times a negative is positive 4 times 4 root 3 is 16 root 3 16 thirds take away 32 thirds is minus 16 thirds so we've got minus 16 thirds pi plus 16 root 3 that's about as simple as we can make it Give your answer in terms of pi we don't have to give it in a certain form so we can just write them the other way around to have the positive at the front 16 root 3 take away 16 thirds pi and that is our shaded area